Hello and uh, welcome to today's edition of Velocity Kinetics. Today we're going to just be talking about, in the UK at least, um, technicalities and difficulties of purchasing a car. Purchasing a car. By technicalities, we don't mean I don't mean you legally can do this, you legally can't do that, so on and so forth. Um, but I've mentioned in various blogs and vlogs. Um, abbreviation like PCP or lease and things like that and some people may not understand what we're ref what I'm referring to and having recently just bought another new car um, I th I think it might be good to run through some of the odds and ends now if your dealer you're purchasing from is any good they'll talk you through everything as you go um, I know the guys at Stone Acre Middlesbrough do and have done even though I've bought this is my third car I bought from them they still talk, talk me through it and they know I work for financial institution again they still because they have to legally tell me anyway they still take the time to go to go through it and don't just brush uh, brush over it um, now the I can't speak for a lot of the second-hand market as to whether or not this this will be the same as I understand it a lot of it will be similar let's uh, let's run through it shall we so it doesn't matter what car you're buying Suzuki Alpha Volkswagen Peugeot you name it it's all they're all going to be different ways and different ways and means of going about things for instance you got Peugeot's current just add fuel deal or you got Suzuki's discount on the Swift the Bellino the S cross um, across the range I can't speak for anyone else because I haven't really been looking around uh, I, I, I just seen the adverts kicking around uh, Facebook. Usually, I go through them, just uh, flip past them, so I haven't paid an awful lot of attention. I think there was something about five thousand off a Vauxhall Corsa. Um, I saw, um, and also you've got the usual um, go, buying, for instance, a pre-registration car, which will save you a bit of, a bit of money, etc. We're going to firstly go through the options for purchasing. Now, I might have to do a hard cut here because Sarah is, short, is due back shortly, so this might suddenly be tomorrow. Um, but so first method of purchase, um, well there are four ways you can, there are a few ways you can buy a new car, there's four off the top of my head, you can go through just a, you can, if you're a regular buyer you can just purchase, you can do PCP, PCL, or you can do HP2O. So just straight up purchase is as, is as simple as it sounds, whether you've got a loan from another company that means you can just go straight to the dealership and go, I want that car and then money changes hands, or if you're fortunate enough to have the money, whether that's through hard graft, or you're just, uh, or whether you, you're lucky enough to be paid a high salary, or you've been gifted the money from someone, or a bonus, whatever, if you just happen to have the money available to uh, to do it, then you just walk into the dealership and go, I want that one, oh, I'd like that, I'd like that, and you, you pay them, whether it's bank transfer, debit card, check, you name it, whatever you do it, that's it, end of the matter, JD, job done. So, first abbreviation I mentioned was PCP personal contract purchase this is a finance this won't be the same for every, for every dealership you you, uh, you go through the principles will be the same but the but the tiny details will be be different so with a PCP you can put down any any amount virtually any amount of deposit whether that's nil or hundred thousand you name it you 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 can you can put put it down they then work the finance out around that. So, for instance, the car I just got, I had a three hundred pound gap voucher, which uh, which meant I had three hundred quid off the purchase of the car, and I put fifty pounds of my own money in. So that basically meant three hundred and fifty pounds of the car was paid for. Now, if you've had a car before, like I did on this one, any residual value on your car after any finance is outstanding will also go towards the deposit. I think in total, with everything I was able to put in, it meant I had about eight hundred and thirty pounds to play with this time. Um, sometimes you might be unfortunate and it's in negative equity uh, something we'll cover in a little bit um, but assuming everything's gone as planned you're stayed within your miles you haven't had any accidents or anything like that with your car it's in good nick you would get some money back for it PCP is designed to be over a certain number of months and a certain duration of uh, and a certain amount of miles this is where things get a bit different because remember the video I did the other day about Looking around when I was talking about looking around at the car when I did the, did the vlog via my phone and then the screen capture. Each manufacturer or dealership will do the PCP over different terms. For instance, remember Ford would only do it over 36 months, Suzuki would do it over 49, some places will do it over even longer. So, it's really down to how much you can afford. If you can afford a lot of money, you could do it over a short period of time. If you can't afford a lot of money, then you 
go, go for a longer period of time. You have a certain amount of miles that you're allowed to do every year. Going over that will incur a penalty in one way or another. Some places, it's when, when you go over your mileage allowance, um, when it's serviced, they'll penalise you at that point. Some of them will penalise you when the car is sold. Some of them will only penalise you when the if the car is handed back to the finance company. If you just go, sorry, I cannot afford it, here's, here's the keys. Then that's when you'll be penalised. Um, I wouldn't recommend going low and then gambling on on the finance company being understanding or the dealership being understanding because everything you agree is worked out on that basis. So say for instance I've done three year purchase, 10,000 miles a year. So at the end of that agreement uh, the, the car won't be necessarily paid off in full because there'll be something left um, but the car's not strictly speaking meant to have any more than 30,000 miles on it. There'll probably be some sort of tolerance within that, but it's not really meant to have it. The guaranteed future minimum value is based on the uh, based on the mileage that you're doing. So, for instance, if you bought a car, three years PCP, 30,000 miles, you hand it back and try to trade it in with 50,000 on, the guaranteed minimum value within your paperwork, that's not going to stand. So if it says, well, the car's going to be worth at least 2,000 pounds, and the garage will go, sorry, I'll only give you 1,000 for it, you can't sit there and quabble with them because you said and agreed 30,000, not 50. The higher the mileage you go, the higher monthly payments. Because obviously you need more of the car paid off by that by that point. It's important to sit and do the maths and work out just how many miles you, 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 you actually need to, uh, to, uh, to cover it. Within the PCP there, there's an, there is a fee in there for option to purchase fee. So at the end of the PCP it might be two years, three years, four years, how long you've done it over. At the end of that, you could decide, if you're in a position to do so, you could decide to buy the, buy the car and own it outright, whether that mean that means refinancing what's out what's outstanding. So that could mean getting a personal loan if you're again if you've been fortunate enough and grafted hard enough to have the money there just to be able to buy it, that's the end of the matter. The car's yours. What often happens at the end of a PCP is people often tend to trade the car in. Because not understandably, even small small amounts of money, two, three thousand pounds is not an easy amount of money to come by. I know for myself, if someone said I need 500 quid, I'd be, it would be a struggle for me to, to do that comfortably and not and not be penny pinching the rest of the month. So, like I say, at the end of the PCP, a lot of people tend to trade in, use the residual value in the car, clear that amount, deposit and go on and so on and so forth. You're not committed to the PCP for the entire time, so it's not a case of if you pay off early or anything like that. Um, you, you won't be hit with a penalty. Of course it is subject to whatever terms and conditions the finance company have, but for the most part a lot of finance companies are quite understanding because ultimately, if you think about it, whether you've, whether you've got a mortgage, whether you've got a credit card, whether you've got a loan, ultimately the institution you borrow the money from wants their money back. Now there might be a certain amount you can overpay by, which is, which is perfectly understandable. You might not have the option to reduce your monthly payments. You might say have grafted and saved up 300 quid, paid it off, but your monthly payments may not drop by, by anything at all. It just means you've got a smaller final payment. You can replace your car partway through the PCP, which is what I did. I was only about 18, 19 months into to the into my last Bellino before I before getting this new one. Um, I had I was in a position to to change it, and Suzuki and Middlesbrough were able to change it so my monthly payments were lower. Quite commonly, that's why people will change it to get the monthly payments lower. As with anything that you don't understand. Uh, finance wise don't just pretend you know um, talk to the dealer they're not financial advisors but they can talk you through what it's meant to be you do have a right to think about the finance I think it's 30 days um, but you can't obviously drive away with a new car at that point you've got 30 days to think about the finance and then if you go yep that's fine then you can have it back now some finance companies will work on the, what's called the rule those called the rule of halves and thirds so if for instance if you're a third of the way through the, the third of the way through the agreement, and you can't keep up the payments, they'll just go right. We're having that back, and then they'll charge you whatever they need to charge you. If you're over of a third of the way through, they'll uh, between between a third and a half of the way through, they'll be. It's very much dependent on your circumstance. They might be able to agree to an arrangement. They might not. They might just say we want it back. When when you're over halfway through, they'll try and work with you to try and make sure you keep the car. But as with anything financial, if you miss a payment, it's going to affect your credit file and, you, and subsequently your credit score and your ability to get finance. So that's PCP. It's quite complicated, 
it it's very daunting. It, it, in all honesty, it is very daunting. Even though I bought three cars through PCP, very daunting. It's a very good system, but take your time. Don't if you feel that the dealer is pressuring you into it, just walk away. Or I need some time to think. PCL is personal contract lease. So lease basically means you're hiring the car for however long you've agreed. So my friend Mikey had a Ford Focus on a lease. So the the Focus wasn't his. It came with whatever options on that he'd that, that the dealer had. He had to pay a, a month an upfront payment, and then he was only allowed to do a certain number of miles a year. But often the advantage of going for a lease is you haven't got to worry about depreciation, and quite a lot of lease agreements will include maintenance. And I have to go sort something out in the kitchen, so I'll be right back. That's that's the time and not anything. <laughs> It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new light. I'm feeling blue. Quite literally. But, anyway, we were all talking about personal contract lease, and the, ha the fact that that in usually includes, or tends to include, your maintenance costs and there's no depreciation. So, yes, on a lease you've got to stump up some money at the front. You've then restricted the number of miles you can do per year. Um, usually with an excessive mileage fee, which, from when I've looked into them myself, the excess mileage fee seems to be a bit, seems to be ha as harsh, if not harsher, than if you go over it on a finance agreement. A lot of leases tend to include the services, so some that might be so you might be looking at the two. And well, why is my lease that little bit more than if I bought it on finance? Well, on finance, you may not actually have a service plan included, um, unless you've asked for it. If you ask for it and it's still lower, then why not? But the lease doesn't always always uh, always include it, or it will only include certain things. So if you shred your tyres, for instance, whether that's because you've been doing being been a naughty boy and been doing donuts, or being a naughty girl and trying to drift your vehicle, or you've just been unfortunate and run over stuff that have punctured your tyre, there's not an awful lot you can do about that, I'm afraid. Some some of them don't include tyres, some of them don't include exhausts. Um, so you'd really have to speak to the individual place that's offering the uh, offering the lease. Um, the advantage with the lease. Get a new car, and it might be of a higher specification than you might have been able to uh, to purchase. Other advantage: no depreciation that you need to worry about. You might be able to purchase the car at the end of the agreement, but again, that's very much dependent on the place that does the um, does the lease for you. Um, but the big, the, the main disadvantage for me when it comes to a lease versus a purchase: when you purchase the car, whether you're buying it outright, PCP, or the next one we're going to go into, which is higher purchase you've got then something to play with at the end not as in you've got a car at the end of the three three four years how long you take your, your your agreement is but what I mean is if is if you're you're fortunate enough and the car hasn't just depreciated like stone you've got some equity to play with to then buy another car with whereas on a lease that's it gone those people who get a car through motability for instance will know what I'm talking about especially if they get for, go, go for ones that need an advance payment you've got to find that Hundred, two hundred, thousand, two thousand, four thousand, five thousand pounds to put down, but you don't get that back. That money's gone at the end. It's a bit like if you rent a house. Some people say, "Well, why do you bother looking after it? Because that's just dead money." So it really depends on on, on your viewpoint on it. But for me, the big negative of a lease is that you haven't got any equity in the car left. To, to, you haven't got any equity or anything like that to play with at the end. You've got to be saving through your course of the agreement to then be able to do your next lease or next purchase. Don't get me wrong, there have been some fantastic lease deals around. I've seen um, over the years, Volvo had a great deal on a V40 not long ago. It was £199 deposit, £199 a month, and it was the SE model. That was the occasion when, remember in the video I did about car purchasing as in experiences, where I mentioned the guy at Mill Volvo in Stockton, where he'd actually been able to get Volvo to... to wave something and, and for me to have a much le lower monthly payment. It is a good idea and I'm very drawn to the idea of leasing um, but the other thing is if something happens um, to you, uh, as mentioned the PCP, the rule of halves and thirds, with the lease more than likely something happened that's it, it's gone. Partic again people on Motability would no would know, will know this a bit more if you've had a relative who's got a car through motability and once they've then died, that's it. 
car's gone, you haven't got any grace period to, to get it. I know that's an extreme example, but it is something that does uh, that does happen. You would need your gap insurance on the lease because ultimately you are still responsible for it. It It's really up to yourself what you want to do with that, but do be aware you would get stung massively, potentially with excess mileage. Um, and or you might have the, the higher costs up uh, up front. Some lease companies might offer you the opportunity to keep the car longer. Again, for instance, Motability um, will offer you the chance to keep the car a bit longer. But at the end of that, that's it. That's that's done. Trade-off is if you've had, if someone's had a lease car or a firm, say for instance, if um, when Mikey gave his Ford back to back, his Focus back to Ford um, at the end of its lease agreement. Probably was on the forecourt the next day for about eight or nine thousand, so you might be able to get a decent used car out of it. But like I say, be careful, think it through, and as with the other two, if you're feeling pushed, ask to ask to walk away, or rather ask to be given a few minutes to think it through. The other th the other type of finance you can get, as I've just mentioned, is higher purchase. So I've mentioned at the start of the video is HP two O. Now. It very much depends on the dealership you're dealing with as to what they call it. HP2O is higher purchase to own, or they might just call it higher purchase. Um, it's a bit like if you buy something out in the catalogue, really. Um, uh, same principle as lease and PCP. You need to put down some money, potentially, if you're in a position to do it. The thing is, though, with higher purchase, at the end of the finance agreement, typically three, four, five years, that's it, the car's yours. No option to pay, option to buy fee, no final payment of four or five thousand however much it is that's it at the end of that agreement that car is yours there's no mileage um, penalties so you could you could rack up as many miles as you want dur during that phase the issue is though because you're committed to a higher monthly payment obviously you're going to be a bit more a bit more stretched um, you're eating into more capital in the car so potentially you've got the you might be better to might be in a better position to change the car than with um, them with a PCP, um, but a lot of the PCP boils down to interest rates. Higher purchase to own is not one I've looked into, but more because I just know I can't afford it. If I was buying a really used car, for instance, uh, quite an old car, if I was buying a car that was maybe seven, eight thousand pounds maximum, then I'd probably go on a HP to own rather than a PCP or or, uh, uh, or trying to get just a regular loan to to buy it outright. Higher purchase is not for everyone and like I said it's it has its advantage at the end of the agreement the car is yours you then haven't got to go I need to find three grand now but like I say you've got the higher month you got a higher monthly payment you might have a higher interest rate you may not have as you might you might be it, it, it a lot depends on the car you've purchased and how you treat it really um how well you look after it but you might not be as lucky with um being able to replace the car, you might be even luckier because you've cleared more capital off the balance. Um, but higher purchase, it's very straightforward. I've you could go in, uh, you could go into Suzuki, uh, buy a Bellino, the SZT for twelve and a half, and say, and I've got two and a half thousand pounds put down, and I want to own the car at the end of the agreement. It's not too bad of a of a way to buy buy a car, um, but like I say, every, everything's got its pitfalls. So they're the four different ways you can buy a car. That. Uh, you can't obviously lease a used car, um, but you can also the other the uh, the buying it outright PCP and HP two O can also be used to buy a used car. One thing to be careful of though when you're buying a used car, particularly if it's through a dealership, is you might be having a higher interest rate on your finance than if you just bought the car new. For instance, the the Bellino I just sold had an interest rate of five point nine. The Bellino I bought's got an interest rate of six point five. Percent now that is quite high, maybe not maybe not quite high. Um, obviously, people would love it to be one, two, three percent, but that's just not gonna not gonna happen. Uh, they need to make money. How do they make money? Through an interest rate. That's not outrageous. But a used car, particularly through a dealership, and Stoneacre Suzuki Middlesbrough said this to my sister when she was by looking at a used one for her Swift. Is their the interest rates on their used cars are that much higher? So actually, by the time you've you might yes, you might have saved a bit of cash price money by buying the two year old Ford Focus that sat on the sat on the on the um forecourt or the two year old Suzuki Swift um that's just sat there. But you're looking might be looking at interest rates of fourteen point nine. Now if you look at 
even with the higher interest rate I've now got on the Bellino of 6.5, it's like 6.5 versus 14.9. It's like, you know, it might be worth that stretching that little bit more to get the newer car. However, in some situations you might be, I'm not, I'm not meaning this to say don't ever buy a used car because there are some fantastic gems on used car lots. But another terp, another thing to look out for when you're buying uh, buying used, you need to obviously look out for if the models have changed. For instance, good example would be Ford Fiesta's just changed, Suzuki Swift changed. The disadvantage you might have is some of the older the older models, the older parts might be harder to come by. Although if it's something where, f for instance, if for instance if you had a last generation Ford Fiesta with the 100 PS three cylinder EcoBoost in it, they still do that in the new Fiesta. So you're not going to be too disadvantaged a lot of the running gear will be the same. However, if you had a Suzuki Swift of the generation I had, and then went on to a Suzuki Swift of, of the new shape with the booster jet engine, there's no, there's no common parts between the two. It's been completely redone from the ground up virtually. So you might struggle when the cars are getting a lot older to get the bits you want. Or if you've got a Suzuki Alto, a Suzuki Alto doesn't exist anymore, it's the, it's the uh, Solario now. Um, if you had an, a Suzuki SX4, uh, years ago, nothing really replaced it, or Suzuki Liana, um, Mondeo's kept itself fairly similar, Volvo, Volvo's are notorious for the older cars being very expensive to, to repair. So be very careful about what you're buying, you might get a very good gem, but like I said, take your time when you're looking through you for, through used, car, uh, used cars, don't be drawn in with ones with lots of gadgets on. Uh, don't be sucking into to it unless it's in fantastic shape or you're buying it from a main dealer with an extended warranty that you can turn around and go this is a dud you've sold me um, the reason why you need to be careful of all the extra features is it's just more things for it to go wrong there is a, a void between new and used that you need to also be careful of or be aware of for some fantastic deals there's XDEM and pre-reg. XDEM is X demonstrator, so it might be the car that they used to use that they used to have ready to go for for test drives. Um, some dealerships do that. I know the Volvo dealership my parents used did that with us do that quite often with the or when the, the C30 still existed. But X demonstrators they they they're good, they're cheap, but depending on the dealership and the dealerships or the manufacturer depending on who it is you're getting it from, depending on their individual company policy the car might have a lot of miles on it. For instance, this, when my mum and dad were looking at buying a C30 years and years ago, they had a testing one, but the one they tested it in had something like 60,000 miles on the clock. It had taken a punishment. The trade-off is X-Demonstrators, again, depending on the, on the chain or the manufacturer's policy, the X-Demonstrator may not be as much of a beat as you think. They might go, well, the X-Demonstrators are only allowed to do two, the demonstrators are only allowed to do a thousand miles, for instance, and then we got to sell them because then they start to become hard to uh, to sell. The de the X demonstrators might might be the most basic and entry level model you can think of. Which, if you're looking for a cheap runaround, then good on you. It's probably a good place to go looking. Some of them might be loaded with tech to show off what you can what you can do. Um, someone at work, his dad bought a Volvo XC90, and it was a demonstrator. Uh, because it was then the X demonstrator, they cut something like ten thousand pounds off the price, uh, and it's a T8 XC90, so that should cost a small fortune. He saved a fair chunk on it. And likewise, my manager, his partner, she bought a, I think it was a Renault Megane or a Vauxhall Zafira, it was something like that. Um, because it was X demonstrator, she saved eight or nine thousand pounds on it. Um, however, some places will label the X demonstrators, or they'll have a bunch of what they call pre-registered cars. Pre-registered, as mentioned, they might have been demonstrators, or they might have just been registered, ready to sell really quick. So it might be a case of being able to walk into the dealership and say, "Have you got a say, a say, a say at Alhambra um, with these mo with these options on?" I'm not really fussed about the colour. They might go, "Got one over there. Just need to screw the number plates on, submit the registration paper with the DVLAs, and to confirm that you're now the owner." Jobs, of, jobs of fish. Depending again, a lot depends on the chain that you're using. I saw on Facebook recently. I had followed the ad for it. It was uh, Jennings were doing a clearance on their pre-reg vehicles, and my God, some of the. If I had a bit more money, I'd have probably gone and got one of those instead because they had a Ford Focus ST line with the 140 apparently 140 PS 
EcoBoost engine. It should have been 26, they were selling it for 17. With hordes of options on it, it's just that's just unbelievable. That's a fantastic um fantastic vehicle for not a lot of money. And likewise they had they had a similar saving on a I think it was a set at I can't pronounce it probably at Attacker, a taker, a taker. Can't their new the new SUV from 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 Sayat. That was a that was a very good purchase and uh, and let's say all the way down the line there were lots of good purchases. The thing is, they were pre-reg. It'll probably be the last last times registration. So the pre-reg one advert I saw, they were all eighteen plates, but they're probably registered in August eighteen before the 68 plates came out on the 1st of September. So they may not actually be as old as you think. But the beauty, if you buy, say, a 68 plate, that could be anything from the 1st of September up until the 28th of February, or 29th of February from the leap year. And likewise, the 18 plate could be any time from the 1st of March, all up to and including the 31st of August. The only downside to the pre-rage vehicles I can think of is they may not have the equipment on that you want. Again, depending on how the dealership classify those cars, you might have a higher interest rate. For instance, again, uh, I have to use my sister as an example again. When, when Before she bought her Suzuki Swift, we'd spotted a Suzuki Swift of the generation I'd just got rid of on the actually in the showroom. But because Suzuki classed it, as pre, it because it was pre-registered, Suzuki classed it as used, so the interest rate was higher. So actually, she'd have had an SZ2, which was the most basic and entry-level and fun to drive, but difficult to live with maybe um for what for what she would for what she does but you'd have paid the in, you'd have been paying more than she just bought the new one like she did so it's all swings and roundabouts um it's all about doing your hope it's all about doing uh, doing your homework with it something else you need to be made aware of when you're purchasing a vehicle is some of the extras that they'll offer but this is this only usually applies to to uh, new cars. I've never heard of it on used, but it doesn't mean to say it's not there. It's just because I haven't bought used, so therefore I don't know if these facilities are offered. Some dealerships might offer standard fit extras, like Stoneacre and Middlesbrough offer to fit parking centres for £199, but they don't sort of push that at the point of sale, but you might see offers like that kicking around. What they might, what, what I would recommend you get, because it's meant to help the uh, guaranteed minimum future value on the car is diamond bright. What that does is it protects the paint. If you think about it, paint is incredibly for what it is, let me see if there's a scrap piece of paper I can use to demonstrate it on. This is this is a very extreme example. But so say for instance so say for instance this is the this is what I would see on my new Beleno. That's what the paint as when it was sat in the showroom, that's what the paint looked like. It just looked like, looked like flat white. But when you zoom in on it. I'm never very good at art school, and if Mrs. Livingston is watching this, quite why she'd be watching it, I don't know. I'd be even more amazed if she remembered me. I know Mr. Verity probably would remember me as someone who got the most fails in a pneumatics, not pneumatics, technical drawing, but anyway. So when you zoom in on your paint, those black bits will present holes. So actually the paint is, it's not necessarily porous as such, but the paint, but the, the, the water sort of sinks a little bit into it, so it, it just sits there. What you'd want, because it's pissing it down out, pissing it down here, I will show you with this. Right, sorry about that, it's taken me a couple of seconds to sort it out. So, Demonstrate what the diamond bright does. Don't know how clear this is on here. Let's just zoom that in. See how the paint, how the water is sat on, sitting on the glass, and sitting on the. Wait, this sits on the, on the paint now. That is what the diamond bright will then do. As I just mentioned, diamond bright before diamond bright, paint's incredibly porous. What they then do is they apply a treatment to it. So as per the video that what it does is it effectively fills in those holes and makes it so the paint so the water will sit on the car. So it's not running off, it'll just sit in little, in little water droplets and, gob and globules. The, the fact the car is white, again, but because I've tried to play the trick of, trick of no one knowing it's been replaced aside from the number plate, um, 
I'm multitasking here and I'm not doing a very good job of it. But what it does is it effectively makes it so the paint so so the paint is is, is no longer poor is no longer porous. It'll also scotch guard the interior. So so similarly, if you have a similar accident in your house, uh, sorry, in the interior, the water should in theory, for instance, if you spill a, spill a bottle of water, not uncommon to do that, um, you spill that on your upholstery, it'll then just sit there in theory, like Scotch guarding up does on your on your sofa, for instance, or on your carpet. Um, obviously, it's not designed to cope with hordes and hordes and hordes of of it. But with the diamond bright, you also get a little pack as well to help you. Kit. It's got some special shampoo. It's got some what they call conserve in it, which effectively retreats the uh, retreats the car. And within that bag, certainly the one I've got, it I've got stuff that spirit glass cleaner, which is fantastic. The stuff to do alloy wheels with, so if you've got a car that's got alloy, keep those looking good. It, I I get a little thing of um, screen wash, it's concentrates, so it's stuff you'd need to water down, but it's still still a nice gesture. You get a sponge, you get spray tops for the uh, spray canisters, get stuff to treat the interior with, and leather, and um, to retreat the glass with, so a little, you might have seen a little bit better on some of the tinted glass on that car. Where the water's just sitting, that that effectively does it. However, do not use the conserve on the glass because that basically makes it when the window wipers are going, it it then creates a film on the glass, which then means nothing can really wash off. Highly recommend Diamond Bright because, like I say, it it improves you, the future minimum value of your car. Again, not guaranteed because obviously a lot depends on how the rest of it, how you've treated the car along the rest of the way. What you can also be offered, which I got from Suzuki when I bought the old Bellino. You can get things like this. Cosmetic repair insurance. I had it for the alloys and I had it for the bodywork. A lot of these are not transferable between purchases. So I had this for my old Bellino, but I can't transfer it onto the new ones. They're having to issue me a refund. Still in two minds whether or not to get it again or or not. Um, but it was about £500, I think, at the time. If you're parked, say, if you live on a street like we used to, where the car used to be just kept on the street all the time and traffic going down there a lot. It might be worth doing that because you might grind your alloys, um, you might grind your or gouge your paintwork and things like that. So it's handy to have that knowledge that there's a certain number of times a year you can claim um, or a certain number of times you can claim over the course of the agreement and get the um, get what you need. For instance, I could have claimed for a new set of wheels every, a new set of alloys every three months um, for five years I think it was. Okay. Was it five years? I can't remember exactly how long, but it basically meant I could have I could have had 18 full new sets of alloys put on that car if I wanted. So it's not a bad one. It's not for everyone. I can't make the recommendation or not. My sister bought it and I, I didn't buy it and I did. Um, she hasn't really needed it. I've paid for it and not needed it. But like I say, I'm not so ignorant as to think I'm I'm immune from it. So let's say I'm thinking about it. It's just finding, as with anything, it's finding the money to uh, to do it if I, if I wanted it. So that's one thing that you'll probably be offered. Uh, can't make, can't recommend it one way or the other. A service plan is something else you might be offered. So that's a certain number of services that's offered. For instance, at Stoneacre, it's usually two services they offer as part of it. So that's usually your 12 and 24, or your one and two year service that they do for uh, for free. Um, because I had a service spare, they've transferred it onto me, so I actually got, I've actually got three free services. But if you've got the service plan, you can transfer that between cars. Um, so if you've got a service spare, it's a fee of £35, I believe it is, to transfer it. Service plan I'd recommend, because then it means you haven't got to find, money for your, find the money for your service. If you've got the most basic of cars, then maybe it's not required. But it helps cover, you haven't then got to find the 50, 60 quid for the, for the, uh, for the guy's time in the garage. So... Again, not one I can recommend. I I, pref I personally like having the service plan because um, I didn't have one before. But like I say, that is really down to you and how you how uh, how you feel. The one thing I would recommend, particularly if you're buying, well, as far as I'm aware, the supplies across the board, whether it's used, leased, new, what I would recommend you get is something called gap insurance. Gap insurance, and um, they'll probably mention it to you in passing in the dealership. They can't really go into it in an awful lot of detail because it, it's a financial advice product, and the guys in the dealership usually are not trained to give financial advice. And um, they're trained to go through their sales process and point out the key facts in the paperwork, but they can't say you should do this, you shouldn't do that. But I would recommend it. What it basically means is if you have a shunt, 
and the car is written off for some reason, when you have a shunt and the car is written off, the insurers will come back and say how much they believe the car was worth, which they'll then pay out to uh, tidy it to, to either say this is what your car is worth. If you if you, your car was finance free, you'd effectively get a check for however many hundred thousand pounds for that amount. If you've got finance in your car, you then have to use that to clear the clear the uh, clear the finance off. If you if the car is written off, um, say for instance, now I'm trying to think out a word it because I've not been experienced in it, thankfully, but I'm just trying to piece it together from what people said. When the car is written off, you sort of can do a bit of back and forth with the um, with the insurance company. Um, so if, say for instance, you've bought a brand new Ford Focus, you write it off 18 months later. At the time you purchased it, it was a twenty thousand pound car. Insurance company might go, well, actually, you've done a lot of miles, so actually the car's only worth, we only think the car's only worth eight grand. Now, you could you could accept that eight grand, go, fine, because uh, you, you might have done a search on We Buy Any Car or something like that and gone, it's actually more than what they said, so you might take it. Um, but you could also push it back, and you can do the rounds, but the trade-off is with that, you may not get more. They might go, well, the 8,000 is as good as you're going to get. We can make you another offer for less. So that one's really up to you, really up to you as to what as to what you would do with that. But I recommend it, especially when you've got a car on finance. Why why do I say recommend it because of cars on finance? So for, say for instance you bought that Ford Focus for twenty thousand, you put down five thousand, so you so the finance was over fifteen thousand. I'm not talking about PCP or HP two O. Just so then if you write write it off and the eight thousand that you get is all is all that the insurance company will give you for it. That still means you've got seven thousand pounds to clear. If you've not got gap insurance, you've got to fit the bill yourself. So whether that means continuing to pay until it's all gone, taking out a loan to clear it off, emptying your savings account, even there's several different things you can you, you might have you might be forced to do, but you've still you're still liable for it. Whereas the gap insurance will then cover that difference between between what the insurance company have offered you and what the outstanding finance is and that gets rid of it all. Unfortunately it means you're starting again so you've got you've got nothing to 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 get yourself back on your feet aside from your savings um or uh, or a loan to get to get your car. But it, it then means you haven't got to fit the bill in that hypothetical scenario of seven thousand pounds. Gap insurance depending on the company, some companies will transfer it between your car. So you could buy a car, change it after eighteen months and then some places will let you transfer it over. Some places don't. I know the company that Stoneacre use don't let you transfer your gap insurance, so I've got to have a pro rata refund of, of the policy and then go from there. What I will have will make you aware of though, especially if your car is in what's called negative equity. So if you owe more than what the car is worth, if you're then refinancing negative equity onto a new purchase, which I did when I bought the first Bellino, you then need a specialist type of gap insurance. There are lots of places you can get GAP from, like Warranty Direct or through or through the dealer. Warranty Direct won't cover a negative, won't give you GAP for negative negative equity. What? So, for instance, when I replaced the red the, my red car for the first white one, I owed one thousand five hundred thirty-two pounds more than what the red car was worth. There wasn't an, not an awful lot I could do about that when I chose to change it. The only thing I could have done was sat and waited, which I didn't really want to do. It then meant that when I got the finance for the first white car, if I'd just got normal gap insurance, they'd have covered me, minus that 1,532. So m make sure you get the right type of, much like when you're buying your car insurance, make sure you get the right insurance for what you're doing. Make sure you get the right gap for what, for what you've purchased. But really, really strongly recommend gap insurance. You Certainly through Stoneacre, um, I assume it's fairly similar elsewhere. You pay for the policy for a year and that covers you for the duration of your finance. So I'm paying £19.17 pence a month for one year and then that's the policy covered all the way up until when the finance is due to be paid off. So, I hope that helps some of the uh, legal jargon, well not, not is, is it legal? Not necessarily legal, but it isn't, isn't. I hope that helps you through some of the jargon when you're purchasing a, purchasing a car. I apologise for about the video being really long, but it's not the most straightforward process, especially when you're brand new to buying a car. Any finance agreement that you take out should offer you the opportunity to overpay on it. But I would say, be kept, as mentioned, I think I mentioned it earlier, um, but like I say, sleep de deprived and it being yesterday, I can't remember exactly what I said, but remember, if you're going to make overpayments onto it, it doesn't always mean that your monthly payments are going to adjust. Um, that's if you're doing it through the through the through the dealer. 
Um, sometimes a dealer might need to use a different finance company to what they would use, for instance. For some reason, Stoneacre declined me on this purchase. I think I know why they did. So actually, my car's with Fiat Finance instead, another one Stoneacre used. So don't be, if, don't be concerned if you get declined for the finance. Usually there's another way around it. Be careful of the guys who offer finance on back for people with bad credit because it's not always as straightforward as that and sometimes you might actually be being stung. Refer this on to your friends um, if they're thinking about buying a, buying a car. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Like the Facebook page, Velocity Kinetics. Um, I'm just, uh, the reason why we've been able to get a lot of episodes out recently is because I've been off, I'm, been off work. Um, so when I'm back at work, activity on the page is going to decrease a little bit. But don't be afraid. Get involved and play hashtag build an F1 team with us as well. That's a game we're, we're, we're always playing. I wouldn't stop playing that for, for anything because people's minds change at the drop of a hat. But, yeah, look after yourselves, drive safe. Um, I can't offer you financial advice when it comes to buying a car, but if you've got questions, drop them on the, drop them on the Facebook page. I'll do what I can to do what I can to give you a bit of steer or give you a bit of explanation with it. Um, but look after yourselves and take care.